Hello, fellow true crime fanatics. My name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for joining in with our book club episode for this month. We are going to be talking about The Last House Guest with, with pff, by Megan Miranda. We're talking about it with her. <laughs> Just kidding. No special guest host today. <laughs> Just the two of us hanging out. <laughs> she's probably glad she's not here. <laughs> If you are feeling generous, we have a Patreon that you can donate some money every month to our podcast. Also, you can go ahead and give us a like, subscribe, five-star rating, all of those kind of things. If you're not feeling like you want to spend a few bucks, we still appreciate your support through social media, YouTube, even Spotify and Apple, all of those different platforms. As we're talking about some of the cases that kind of correlate to the book, as we normally do, don't forget to go to our website theabysspod.com and you'll be able to see a bunch of pictures and notes and things like that to get a better idea of who the people are and things about the case such as what the accident looked like the crime scene and anything else we can find to give a little summary about the book it is quote Littleport, Maine has always felt like two separate towns, an ideal vacation enclave for the wealthy whose summer homes line the coastline, and a simple harbor community for the year-round residents whose livelihoods rely on service to the visitors. Typically, fierce friendships never develop between a local and a summer girl, but that's just what happens with visitor Sadie Lohman and Littleport resident Avery Greer. Each summer for almost a decade, the girls are inseparable until Sadie is found dead. While the police rule the death a suicide, Avery can't help but feel there are those in the community, including a local detective and Sadie's brother, Parker, who blame her. Someone knows more than they're saying, and Avery is intent on clearing her name before the facts get twisted against her. Another thrilling novel from the best-selling author of All the Missing Girls and The Perfect Stranger, Megan Miranda's The Last House Guest is a smart, twisty read with a strong female protagonist determined to make her own way in the world. End quote. So we talked a little bit about Megan Miranda with our All the Missing Girls episode, but if you missed that one or just don't remember... Here's a little bit about her. She currently lives in North Carolina with her husband and children. She went to MIT and she worked in bioengineering originally. She had a big scientific career and she even won some awards, I think. But she ultimately decided that she really wanted to write novels. So she switched over and started writing young adult and adult thrillers. She says she gets inspiration from authors like Michael Crichton. And she's, I think she's written... I think this is her second or third adult. I think it's her third one. And then there's a new one that's coming out in July as well. So, um, and she also has like two or three young adult books. Just leave it on the shelf. (laughs) You might have been able to tell already that (laughs) this wasn't our favorite book. (laughs) But we're really trying to give Megan that redemption arc. Yeah, we know a lot of people do like her. Like a lot of people love her books, but a lot of people also love like, you know... James Those little Patterson. novels you, yeah, James Patterson and the little novels that you buy at Harris Teeter or Walmart. <laughs> the, like apple pie murder. Yeah, yeah. So it's like to each their own. And yeah. I think Brittany and I have very similar reading styles for the most part. She likes nonfiction. <laughs> I'm not as much about it. But I think we have similar like tastes in what we like. So neither of us are really fond of, I think, Megan Miranda in general after our second round. <laughs> but if you did like this book, tell us what you liked about it. Tell us your favorite parts and maybe we can see things in a different perspective yeah please don't hate us just because we (laughs) don't like this book trust me we love Michael Crichton okay (laughs) so jumping into our opinions on the book itself I for one definitely liked this better than all the missing girls just not being told backwards was a huge improvement yeah honestly (laughs) but Megan Miranda really likes her mean girl tropes and I think that gets a little over the top sometimes the Hamptons kind of setting you know like the playground of the rich in the summer kind of versus locals was interesting and it kind of reminds me of there was a show called Revenge um which was really good in the first season and (laughs) just the first season (laughs) as are most television shows (laughs) and it was kind of about like a girl that goes back to this like rich Hamptons kind of place and gets revenge on people that hurt her family somehow I can't remember exactly how but Hmm. it was a good show in the first season so it kind of gave me those vibes it also kind of gave me the pretty little liars thing which I'm pretty sure we said about all the missing girls and 
that like that's fun when you're young like that's more of a young adult theme to me yeah I feel like she has a hard time deciphering between her young adults and her adults like yeah and there's this, a fine line this book definitely she kind of jumped <laughs> into both spaces with that and yeah like she she could have written it for young adult and then just been like oh they're actually 30 to 40 yeah. you know and yeah that's it <laughs> that was definitely jarring <laughs> for me to realize that these girls were like 30 years old so it definitely kind of had the inauthenticity sort of that you got from Pretty Little Liars like it was a fun show for like the drama but not as like a representation of teenagers you know like it was just very which side note I don't know if you ever read the Pretty Little Liars books those are they're like nothing those are some of the worst books I've ever read in my life just the grammar and syntax they'd be like oh this 15 year old girl was like sitting at the mall drinking wine like what what (laughs) no (laughs) sure sure she was (laughs) that like (laughs) non-alcoholic sangria (laughs) genuinely (laughs) terrible books but anyway um so yeah, like we said, it had, it was like everything about it was young adult and then she just like tacked on higher ages basically. So yeah. the timeline for me was kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. I also thought that like the characters were hard to connect with because you really only had one character to connect with the entire book and it was like <laughs> if you didn't match with her, yeah, you didn't really enjoy it and like you just kind of were along for the ride. Yeah, and that's one reason the timeline kind of messed me up a lot because when we read the synopsis first, to me it was like they met when they were kids and they kind of grew up together and like she was exposed to this wealthy life and all that, but it was really like they met when they were adults and then they continued to be friends through they were adults, but they were still doing like teenage stuff. No, I know I know what you mean. Like it's it's kind of like as an adult you don't do secretive house parties and try to hide from the police, you know? Yeah. But as a kid, you might. And so at the beginning with their little bonfires on the beach and drinking and running away in the woods and all this stuff, it seems like more something you would do at 18. Yeah. But they were in their 20s. Yeah. And then she's older and they're still throwing this house party and there I mean that's how I took the plus one party was yeah. like a like, like kind a, of a trashy house yeah, party exactly rather than like a formal town party kind mm-hmm. of thing so it made it kind of strange but then it was like the police all knew that this like plus one party happened yeah so but they were still like afraid that the police were gonna like shut them down yeah and like it, it was, was kind of weird it was weird so that made it really hard to connect to her because it was like are you 15 are you 30 like wh- I you know yeah it makes me wonder if she may have started it off as like a young adult and then tried to tweak it to be an adult thriller instead for some reason yeah and just wasn't able to get all of the pieces of the book lined up correctly because there really wasn't anything in it that made it anything other than pg maybe pg-13 at most yeah there was like a kiss yeah and oh and then she slept with connor yeah but it wasn't like graphically described even the murders weren't graphically described or anything like that not that it has to have that but even that would have given it more of a semblance of like Mm -hmm. adult yeah novel because clearly the timeline did not. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so I definitely think this could have been a better book. <laughs> Just like the first book, she was jumping timelines. And in this book, she was like partially jumping timelines. Yeah. But also like sucked with ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, it could have been so much better if she had just said, okay, they met when they were like 12. And now they're, you know, 18, 19. And well... That being said, the other problem I had was their friendship was 10 years, but then it's like they really didn't know each other at all. And like she was always on the outskirts of this family, but you're friends for 10 years. Like that's that's a long time to be friends with somebody. And then the way she wrote it felt like they had only been friends like maybe a couple years and like not super, super close at that. Yeah, so. I mean, Brittany and I, we've known each other for, like, what, five years-ish? Maybe a little over? Or no, oh my gosh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Backtrack, two years. I was jumping ahead in my thoughts. Two years, think about timesing that by five. See where the five came in? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> think about timesing that by five and still not knowing yeah. about me or like, about you. You know, like... Yeah, and, like, basic stuff. It wasn't just, like, oh, she had secrets. It was, like, you didn't know her at all. <laughs> and yeah. Like, and everyone was, like... 
like oh you didn't know her she had family a diary? being like that was her handwriting yeah. and then like, <laughs> like what, what? <laughs> <laughs> no 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 <laughs> you don't know your own daughter's handwriting yeah and it's funny because like nothing in that diary ever mentioned Sadie like by name ever yeah like, she didn't write anything about Sadie <laughs> ever when her life was like absorbed for 10 years Sadie. yeah for 10 years <laughs> nothing so that was like a little off for me I think it could have been better you know if they had been younger but also if it had just been like a couple of years because also also there were no you know homework sheets yeah there were no files she had written like, on no checks else. to match she had to. never written a thing there in was her life absolutely nothing else you could have compared the handwriting <laughs> yeah. to and it was crumpled up in the garbage and remember she's like in it was her late 20s yeah like, late 20s <laughs> she never wrote a thing down her whole life oh my gosh she ran a business for her parents and never wrote anything down absurd <laughs> but uh, yeah that's just wild but if like if they had been friends for only like a couple years because remember it was like they were friends in the summer and then Sadie goes off and then she's like Avery's back in her life but then she's out of touch with all these people you know like oh I haven't talked to him in years and whatever so it's like what is she doing the rest of the year (laughs) nothing yeah it didn't it didn't fit like you would think that it would be more like oh in the summer she's hanging out with like these people and then in the rest of the year she's still hanging out with like her older friends and then that would create the turmoil but just to be like oh since I met Sadie we fell out with all these people like what are you doing nine months out of the year literally (laughs) so yeah the weird like teen angst mixed with the business problems like embezzlement and the financial records was just a weird murder (laughs) (laughs) it was weird I do think to give her a little bit of credit I think that Avery's backstory kind of being sprinkled in like you find out her parents died and then you find out like a little bit more and a little bit more I think that was pretty well done and she didn't over explain it like you're an idiot so I appreciate that when it's not like you know smushed into your face that like what the twist is gonna be I think she kind of she did a lot better with tapering that yeah than she did in all the missing girls yeah I agree with you I think she did a good job at dropping the hints to actually accumulate to something definitely with like her incorporation of the past stories however I feel like three-fourths of the book was her just like living in memories yeah and it was just like okay okay and so part of it was like for me at least I would skim because I was like I don't this is not going to be important to me I don't need to know about the contractor okay like I just don't need to know about Wes the contractor y'all probably don't even remember that name I just do because I joked about it with Brittany so it's like there were things in it that just I felt like she went too hardcore into diving into these past memories and stories when they weren't going to mean anything and I think it feels weird because you you're like oh well you don't want to dive in them into the only the important ones because then you are like oh well that's going to be in the end so there's a fine line to balance, but I mean, we've seen a bunch of other authors be able to do it. Yeah. So there's a way to dive into the past stories and bring up someone's glasses or the scar or different things like that without being like, that's suspiciously put in there, you know? Mm-hmm. And she didn't do that as much. Instead, she just made a ton of backstory. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first half of the book could have been like a tenth of the size and then the second half of the book should have been expanded more. Because I think it got better, like, a half to two-thirds through. I think it started picking up and, like, more was happening. And it wasn't just, like, I remember when I was sitting on the beach and doing this. And, like, no one cares. Yeah, I really only enjoyed, like, a third of the book. (laughs) (laughs) I did, like, the kind of theme about the dynamic between, like, a girl that's at this low point in her life being sort of adopted by a socialite and getting like tossed into this wealthy lifestyle and stuff I think that can be a cool story but again for the timeline for like being 10 years involved with this family and you being know in your 20s yeah and being, being like, like inseparable and like all the stuff that she described it just it just didn't feel connected like it just I don't know there was something just missing with it yeah, and I agree. I think she did it well. I think she did the whole bringing her in under her wing kind of thing Corinne. well. Bringing you, her you back, <laughs> bringing her in. Oh, I thought you said Corinne. No, I was like you back in the bit last. We part. not going to all the missing girls again. We done with that mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, she brought her in under her wing, and I thought she did a good 
job at it but I also feel like that's kind of a cliche that's overdone you know Mm -hmm. almost like the bad boy like the girl falls for the bad boy and he becomes good yeah and manic pixie dream girl kind of stuff yeah Yeah. so even though she did it well I still felt like she could have done a little bit something else like even just I don't know a good way to flip it around would be that the bad girl is the main character and took the good girl under wing. The good girl died. Yeah. You know, like just, just like do a different perspective, a do mm-hmm. a little something different, but she kept it pretty bland in my yeah. point of view. I think she's very attached to the mean girl trope where it's like, cause Who all the missing you. Yeah, really? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like but all seriously. the missing girls was like that where it was, this girl was taken in by this outgoing extrovert and then she dies and then yeah. it's like and then this time it's like oh she's taken in by this girl that's not very nice Sadie wasn't very nice she never apologized she was, she was dangling stuff in front of her family's yeah, face trying like, to like antagonize them about their secrets mm-hmm. so it's like she wasn't a great person and yeah like, oh she died and I mean I have not read The Perfect Stranger her other book I have not but The Perfect Stranger <laughs> I feel like that also probably has someone in it that's a mean girl yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think she's very attached to these tropes that are pretty common. And I think there again, those are much more, they they much more fit in young adult. Young high school girls or like early college girls, I feel like would connect to that more and find that more of an interesting thing. But when it's about older people and it's for older people, I just think it misses the mark a little bit. There were some creepy elements to the book, the suspense of someone like breaking into the house and watching her and the candles being lit after she explained like lighting all the candles in the house the night of the like her death and stuff and I think it would have been cool if that was sort of wrapped up into the actual crime yeah but it was just like oh it was just her hanging out lighting some candles oh my gosh so I think that it was a unsettling like concept like it was creepy to think about but then it kind of flopped in the end <laughs> yeah like she could have even said like oh you know actually the police officer was the one going into these houses and setting up things that he knew about from the night of the murder to deter her because he knew that she was getting closer to the answers and didn't want her to have the same fate as Sadie boom yeah. you have a different ending and that's pretty boss because it ties <laughs> together all of the break-ins rather than just being like oh it was that good girl faith just yeah. hanging out hanging out <laughs> Like I said, it got a lot more interesting, like a little more than halfway through the book when she found the flash drive and was starting to unravel everything. And I thought it was kind of a cool twist to open. Is Avery actually a low man? Having that avenue opened up, but then that was kind of cut off pretty quick too. Yeah, I was kind of, I was still confused about what she was in inferring about it all by the time it was already closed <laughs> this topic I was like oh 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 okay okay yeah like those <laughs> random DNA tests she was like oh yeah. that's why she made me take a DNA test oh yeah that's why that one time she swapped my mouth <laughs> like what and she was like maybe we're cousins maybe we're distant relatives yeah <laughs> so, okay. we're not even from the same place <laughs> yeah who are you <laughs> I don't even know you after yeah. 10 years <laughs> I think the end was pretty good for compared to the rest of the book yeah um it was definitely a twist that I wouldn't say I didn't see it coming but I think it was a good twist yeah with the police officer but the thing that I thought was weird is just how abruptly it the whole thing ended it was like oh the fight and the fire and all this stuff and then she was just like running and she was like it's him and then Parker just pushed him off a cliff and then it's done like yeah like not even like no struggle yeah no struggle no fight (laughs) just like you tell me a big bulky cop just went down like nothing yeah just (laughs) fell right off the cliff right in front of all these people yeah a memorial (laughs) yeah I didn't see it coming I think she did put a good spin on it but it could have been well well it could have been better executed Mm -hmm. I think that's the resounding theme like it has potential but just the execution was yeah like shaky I think the highest praise I can give her right now is that I liked this book a lot more than James Patterson (laughs) (laughs) I didn't even read James Patterson I stopped so I would second it I would second that I actually read this one In some ways, that's very high praise. (laughs) Yeah, that is. Overall, though, I think that Mega Miranda is just, like, not for me. I've tried twice now. I'm still not into it. 
I think that she did a little bit better than all the missing girls, but I really didn't enjoy myself. So when I say a little bit better in the grand scheme of it, that's like a millicentimeter. <laughs> Let's throw in the millicentimeter <laughs> together. Yeah. But um, overall, I think like two to three stars because my rating for like one is like the worst book I've ever read. And she's not the worst book I've ever read, but she's just barely a two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say like... I think I'd give her like 2.5 or 3. Ooh, generous. Out generous. Of five. <laughs> That's generous. 3 for me is like average. We have like different ratings. <laughs> we do. <laughs> After we all, five go. stars like it's nothing. I know. <laughs> I'm like the um Simon Cow. Yeah. You're like the Howie Mandel. <laughs> the Howie to my Simon. <laughs> Okay, so diving a little bit into the true crime cases that kind of correlate to it, we've had to reach a little bit, just a little bit, but you'll get the gist. (laughs) So first would be like the murder of someone in a wealthy small town. Back in 1949, a man named Grover Hart, he was 68 years old, was working his shift at the Indian Harbor Yacht Club as a night watchman. He actually had chauffeured in the past Dan Topping, who, if you don't know, is the co-owner of the New York Yankees. So he's, I guess, a little bit up there. He was working in a bougie town, living the bougie life, supporting bougie people. (laughs) But one night in 1949, he was making his rounds, and he ended up getting shot by two bullets from two different guns. One of the bullets ended up hitting his kidney and he died two days later, but thankfully he was able to give the police a description of the shooter, just one of them, before he died. They ended up confirming that it was two petty criminals through some ballistics and the stolen loot from the yacht club. It had their logo on it and everything, so they were like, "Mm, you probably took it from there. The bullets and casings came from a 22 caliber pistol that was in a car that the two men had stolen prior. And the police also got a description of a man named Francis Smith. He also goes by Frank Smith. And he was caught with hair dye and admitted that he was trying to change his look. So clearly trying to evade the police in some sort of way. And his accomplice was George Loudon. Loudon ended up taking a plea deal to get out of the electric care. care. <laughs> to get out of the electric chair, and in return, he gave some more information about Smith. He ended up recanting his statement, though, on the witness stand and said that the police forced him into the initial statement. I guess maybe he didn't want to seem like a snitch, so he was trying to make it seem like he was backing on out of that. Smith, however, would not confess. He just repeatedly claimed that he was innocent, and it was kind of hard to go against. He had been on the wrong side of the law since he was about 13 years old, So he was constantly in and out of juvie and doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. So it was kind of hard to go against the grain on that one, but he could be tied to the murder pretty easily. He was convicted of first degree murder, which is a capital offense, and Smith ended up throwing Loudon under the bus. Loudon reenacted the night's events for the police, and he confirmed that he only shot his gun once, but Smith shot his four times. On June 7th in 1954, Smith came within two hours of the electrocution chair when they ended up changing his sentence to life in prison. So he slipped by the skin of his teeth, you know. It's hard to know for certain, but Smith is known as the longest serving prisoner in the U.S. And he's still alive to this day. So it's, I think, 71 years now that he's been in prison. There is someone in prison who's like 94, I think they said, but he hasn't been in there as long as Smith has been. It's not 100% certain because I guess they just don't have the records on it. But a few um, like ancestry type of people, historical what are they called histology histology is that historian historians oh gosh talk about a brain fart historians they have looked into it and done their research they even talked to the jails and stuff like that and they have not been able to find anyone who's been in there longer than francis smith 
1967, Smith actually escaped from prison. He was considered a super good prisoner and was allowed to do more stuff. You know how they give a little bit of leniency to the ones that are well-behaved? Well, that was regretted because he stole a truck and was captured about 12 days later. He, at the time, held a golf golf officer. He, at the time, held an officer at gunpoint and took $300. So he was just, you know, digging himself a little hole. It was even sadder because only three years later and he would have been eligible for parole. Loudon ended up being paroled in 1966, did what he was told. And Smith was given parole in 1970s. I think it's like 74, 75, but he was only in it for like 10 months until he violated it and was put back in prison in 75. There are some people out there who think that Francis Smith is innocent. They think that he didn't even kill Grover Hart. This is because he constantly claims his innocence. Loudon had retracted his statement and also a man named David Blumetti, who was a prisoner and who was a prisoner in Alabama prison, confessed to working with Loudon for the murder and robbery. They really thought that this was just an attempt to get out of the Alabama prison. He was known to really dislike it there, but the court called his statement unworthy of credit and it just kind of was dismissed. They were like, "We have so much on Francis Smith that your statement is worthless to us." Mm. And that is how the case remains to this day. So another theme that came up a few times in the book is someone being pushed off a cliff. And the story we have for you on this is a woman named Semra Isol. Sorry if I'm butchering that name. There's a lot of Turkish names in this story. So, But in June of 2018, Semra and her husband Hakan were on vacation at a place called Butterfly Valley in Mugla, Turkey. And it was a really beautiful area. It's overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, and it's just lots of beautiful hiking. But Summer was actually seven months pregnant, so hiking down a mountain probably wasn't (laughs) the most fun thing. But they were sitting at the top of this cliffside for a long time, like several hours, and a tourist near them noticed that Hakan was acting kind of squirrely and decided to start filming He saw Hakan holding Semra's hand and leading her down this path around the cliff edge, so kind of down a perilous little path down the cliff, which, remember, she's seven months pregnant, so that's terrifying enough on its own. Then Hakan led her up to the edge of this cliff on this overlook, and they took some pictures, and then allegedly Hakan pushed her, and she fell a thousand feet to her death. Police were pretty suspicious immediately, and they said that the reason that the couple were at the top of this cliff for so long is because Hakan was waiting for them to be alone, that he was waiting for everyone else to leave, and trying to find this like perfect time when no one would be around. Semra's family said that Hakan showed absolutely no emotion, was not sad at all, did not appear distraught. He actually went back to the place where his wife fell and took some pictures as a tribute and posted them online, but that was pretty much the extent of like his shows of emotion. Even that is creepy because I feel like personally, if someone had died, I would avoid that place like the plague. Yeah, why would you want to go to the place where she fell off the cliff? Unless you're a murderer. Mm-hmm. Hakan's version of events were, quote, after taking a photo, my wife put the phone in her bag. Later, she asked me to give her the phone. I got up and then heard my wife scream behind me. And I walked when I walked a few steps away to get the phone from her bag. When I turned back, she was not there. I did not push my wife, end quote. But Semmer's family pushed harder and looked into Hakan and actually found that he had taken out several loans in Semmer's name. And they knew that Summer was very much against loans, very much against doing this. So they knew that he had done it without her knowing. He also tried to collect the equivalent of about $57,000 in life insurance on her death. But because it was a suspicious death investigation, they denied this claim. 
Police arrested Hakan and suspected that the murder was premeditated and that he was just doing it to get money because he was in over his head with these loans and basically sacrificed his wife and unborn child for a little bit of money that he didn't even get. Another kind of overarching theme of the book is that the cop is covering up a crime, right? He's covering up a mistake he made while on duty. So that is what we're also going to talk about today. Trust me, there are many, 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 many different scenarios of this where cops try to cover up their tracks because they know the law. They know they'll get in trouble. They know what they can and can't do. And sometimes they do it anyway. So our example today is a man named Nicholas Morrow. He worked for the Denver Police Department in Colorado, and he was fired for what is known as a series of bad decisions while he was on duty. In November, on November 19th in 2019, around 12.30 a.m., Morrow started following an SUV for having a broken taillight. He was reaching speeds of about 85 to 90 miles per hour when he started tailing him, but he never turned on his lights, sirens, or body camera. So he was basically could have looked like a car race in another car. Like he didn't do anything that he was supposed to do. He didn't also, he did not request authorization from a dispatcher for the pursuit. So he was just kind of flying solo at this point. He did end up calling a fellow officer on his personal cell phone, not the work cell phone to tell him that he was pursuing this car. And the other officer was able to find the SUV as well and knew that it was exceeding a hundred miles per hour. So if Mara was tailing this guy, he had to also have been going at least a hundred miles per hour, right? So they ended up losing the SUV and Morrow was able to find it again when he was by himself and the officer was not with him. So he started following it. He saw this SUV crash into someone's garage and Morrow then decided that he would pull over and turn on his lights and camera. So that was the first time he turned on any of his stuff. He went to the car and noticed that the He went to the car and noted that it was empty, so the guy driving had ran, and he also noticed that the airbags had deployed. Morrow decided to turn off the car instead of leaving it running and waiting for someone to arrive, and it rolled backwards and hit his cruiser. So, we're seeing this series of bad events here, right? It gets worse. Morrow then decided to file a false report saying that he had just found the SUV damaged right there, right on site. So he contacted the homeowner and she said that she didn't own the vehicle. I guess he was like, ma'am, is is this your car? You know, (laughs) and like pretended like he wasn't just following it all the way there. And she was like, no, I don't know this car. And so the homeowner wanted to file a report. But Morrow was like, no, 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 you can do it online. Here's my business card. Just do it online. So he went back and he logged that he found it and that he also found it several miles from the block that it actually was on. (laughs) So he was not making sense with any of his information. He also ordered a tow truck to come and get the vehicle, but he didn't mention that it wrecked into the home. He didn't mention that it damaged his car. He didn't do say anything. So after that, so... (laughs) So after the tow truck came by, he went back to the office and he covered the damage to his car with a whiteout. (laughs) Like, just take that in for a second. He used paper office supplies and tried to fix his cruiser, (laughs) government property. So, yeah, that's another situation. Then Maru decided, like, he was probably freaking out, you know. He was doing a lot of things not by the books. Something bad had happened. He was lying. And trying to just make it by. So he decided to text the homeowner around 2.30 in the morning. 2.30 in the morning. Being, hey, just wanted to follow up. Say that, you know, we've got it going with the stuff. Yada, yada, yada. And then he wrote her again at 2.30 p.m. the same day. But obviously, like, you know, not the middle of the night at this point. And asked her if she had followed up about the incident or filed the report online. And at this point... He didn't know that she had already contacted the corporal and reported the entire incident. The stories didn't align with the paperwork that Officer 
Morrow had filed. So he knew that he was pretty much going to get busted at this point. He tried to explain his actions away as well by saying that a month prior, his wife had a miscarriage. So this was causing him a bunch of stress and chaos. But I feel like, you know, as we say, police should undergo the same things as officers or as military officers, right? Yeah. <laughs> the same mental psyches, because if that was the case, you shouldn't have been doing duty work at the time. Yeah. If you can't abide by the law. Such a strange thing to do like such a strange thing to get in trouble for <laughs> like, i know why not just do it right yeah so he ended up getting fired from the denver police so that's just one of the multitude of examples about police officers trying to cover up for some mistakes that they may have made when they were on duty mm. the other theme that we're connecting to true crime is underage drivers killing people obviously in the book parker killed avery's parents and that whole thing was covered up so the first case is that of Ethan Couch and on June 15th of 2013 Ethan who was 16 years old at the time with a restricted driver's license drove a car while he was drunk and on drugs he had seven friends in the car with him and was driving through um, I just have to say <laughs> unless it's a minivan you don't have seven seatbelt buckles okay yeah I think it was a pickup truck if i remember correctly mm, but even i'm worse. not positive i know it was like a ford i think it was a ford ranger but i'm not positive even worse <laughs> yeah and they started out the night by stealing a couple of cases of beer from walmart and then driving through a neighborhood at 70 miles per hour there was a group of people on the side of the road someone had a disabled vehicle and some people were there to help and try to figure out why the car was stalled but Ethan plowed through this neighborhood, lost control of the car, and hit this group of people. Four of them were killed, and nine people were injured, including two of his own passengers, which were severely injured, and one was even completely paralyzed. That is a doozy. Yeah. He was indicted on four counts of manslaughter, and if you know this case, it's probably because... It came under a lot of fire when his attorney argued that Ethan was from an affluent family. They were wealthy. He was never taught boundaries. So he just didn't know. Oh, exactly. <laughs> like textbook Parker from the book. Yeah. So he, he just didn't understand boundaries. He didn't understand that he couldn't do whatever he wanted. He didn't understand the consequences, even though he's a 16-year-old kid. So are you saying we should charge you as well for not teaching him these boundaries and consequences? Mm. But his lawyers argued that he shouldn't go to prison because he really didn't understand any of this stuff. And the judge actually basically agreed. He only got 10 years probation and he got this mysterious, undetermined length stay in a long-term psychiatric like drug rehab facility. But he wasn't in there all that long. And this is one of those cases that people argue about, quote unquote, affluenza, where these kids are growing up thinking that they are entitled to do whatever they want and no consequences. It doesn't matter. I mean, he killed four people. You know, someone's paralyzed for life. Like, nine people were severely injured. So, Ethan and his family actually had a lot of history of trying to, you know, push influence with money. Ethan actually started driving himself to school when he was 13 years old. And when school officials school officials were like, um, what? <laughs> He's 13. His dad got super mad and threatened to buy the school. And then he ended up pulling his kid out of school and putting him somewhere else. <laughs> but can you imagine being like, I'll that, buy this school. I hate when people are entitled like that. Like your kid is a fuck up. Like do something about it. Okay. Like we all know, you know, like don't be ignorant. Do something about it because clearly he should not be driving to school at the age of 13. And even if he did it without your approval, don't sit here and get prideful and be like, Oh, no, he does nothing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, do something. That's why he doesn't know his consequences. Yeah, and it sounds like his parents don't either, so that's why he's that way. His mom was a nurse, and she had her license revoked. She also, the same year that this accident happened, she was driving. Um, she got some kind of, like, citation for driving under the influence or without a license or something and got in trouble and had to pay a fine. And his dad was in a bunch of different situations. There was one he was um, charged with 
impersonating a police officer he was charged with domestic abuse apparently he choked his girlfriend he hit his wife all kinds of things so just a whole family of people entitled to do whatever they wanted with no consequences biggest pet peeve that is my biggest pet peeve is when people do that so annoying so this was 2013 that the accident happened so he went into this mysterious rehab program but by the end of 2015 there was a video posted online of ethan playing beer pong and drinking at a party and this violated his parole so police decided to go pick him up but he skipped town and he his mom went missing too they couldn't find them they filed missing person reports and it wasn't until a couple weeks later they found them just hanging out on a beach in puerto Vallarta in mexico just having a good old time and that's the family that's the type of family that's like involved with the black market you know yeah like just un- like no organized remorse, crime no no morals no ethics nothing can get away with anything they think they have all the money in the world to run the world like mm-hmm. so after quite a bit back and forth ethan was brought back to the u.s and he was sentenced to two years in prison and he was released in 2018 and then by march of 2019 he had his ankle monitor removed that he had after being released in january of 2020 he was arrested again for having thc in his system but then he was released because they couldn't tell if it was from marijuana or if it was from um cannabis oil or like some other means so they released him which there again like no consequences there there is a prime example of those cases you look at and you said there were so many times the police could have stopped it could have stopped it Mm -hmm. this is when they should be stopping it because he's going to do something or is already doing something like serial killers do and he's getting away with it or he's going to do something that's horrific like a a school shooting or a bombing or Or whatever he wants driving drunk again driving drunk again and killing you know a school bus like you don't you could be putting so many people's lives at stakes because you're letting a person like him who gets away with everything and obviously has no care in the world no remorse no you know moral code ethical code he needs to be held responsible i'm not saying he should spend his life in prison but i'm saying he needs to be held responsible for the actions that he's doing and this is why we have people who go out there and do crazy stuff multiple times getting caught and never have to face repercussions for them yeah because i mean he had 10 years probation but during that time he was doing whatever he wanted partying drinking doing whatever so no one was watching him that closely and then he had a short stay in some kind of rehab which obviously didn't take because he was drinking doing drugs later and then he had two years in prison which i'm sure it was one of those cushy you know like low security kind of prisons i'm sure like he, he wasn't put in like a super max yeah i mean he could literally be out here raping girls left and right one of those kind of guys and paying them off people paying them off to keep silent you yeah. know like he could be he literally could be damaging thousands of people's lives and no one's doing anything because they keep just letting him go yeah and there was a ton of outrage about this case and how wealthy affluent people are treated way differently than lower class people and how this situation affected so many lives like he killed four people that's like hundreds of lives that you affected because think of everyone that was connected to each of those four people Mm -hmm. everyone that was connected to the person who got paralyzed everyone who was connected to all the people who were injured the nine people like and like he just doesn't care like that's i'll put a fist to him (laughs) that's like the worst part is like that could have changed his life that could have like made him turn things around but it didn't he just continued if that happened on to me, i would never drive again yeah <laughs> and would... like clearly revoking his license or doing probation or things like that didn't matter he was driving when he didn't have a license yeah. like what does he so, care it doesn't matter but they there have been many lawsuits with this case a lot of the families of the victims have sued i think there were like eight or nine lawsuits total so it's definitely still kind of an ongoing thing and something that is still a hot topic because you know he faced almost no consequences for ending four lives and you know many others with severe injuries like being paralyzed the rest of your life that means you know now that person's family has to take care of them and that changes their life that changes you know their that entire future so many many people affected with this and many people still outraged i know affluenza has come up several times in the last few years um 
So it's definitely an interesting well, topic. Well, affluenza, yeah, but also just people who are entitled rich people. Well, that's basically you know? what affluenza means. It's like I thought affluenza was like young people. No, it's it's just like anyone that's affluent can do whatever they want because they're affluent. Oh, I see, I see. So yeah, affluenza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely a frustrating one and one that and it happens all the time oh yeah absolutely. we've talked about it in another episode another book club episode Probably. where he was like what raping one of his kids or something like that sexually abusing them or something remember and he like paid it off and it didn't get brought back up until like oh, a couple yeah. years later and mm-hmm. he got off with it for years yeah because he was just like that kind of stuff money. just happens all the time and in this case like you said like it would be not at all surprising if he would kill more people by drunk driving or doing drugs or any of this stuff, just not caring. Like it's very likely that he would be a repeat offender. Another instance of this was in Australia of actually this year. So January 26th of 2021, a couple Matthew Fields, no Matthew Field and his partner, Kate Ledbetter, um, they were walking. She was pregnant with their first son named Miles and they were just walking their dogs around the neighborhood and a 17 year old stole a car he was under the influence of either drugs or alcohol and basically he barreled through a red light and hit a truck head on and then spun out and rolled into Matthew and Kate and struck them both and killed them both at the scene he took off and tried to evade the police. He ran into a house, he stole some keys, and got into their garage and tried to start the car, but they caught up to him, and then he ran again, but they eventually arrested him. There were six other people that were injured in this crash as well, so once again, two people killed, and, you know, an unborn baby that would never have a life, and then six other people injured, He received two counts of murder along with charges relating to not being qualified to drive, being intoxicated while driving, burglary, and fleeing the scene. His identity and past record hasn't been released because he was a juvenile. On a little tiny happy note with the case, the two dogs that the couple were walking, they ran off when the crash happened, but one was found that same night and then The whole community kind of pulled together to find the other dog. They made a Facebook group about it. They had dozens of people out there searching for this dog, and they eventually found it. And um, the dog actually had, I think, Addison's disease. So it was an expensive, like, medical situation. And a local vet offered to treat it for free. So that was nice. And these two dogs found good homes. There's a GoFundMe that's still going to help with the cost of the family, and we'll have a link to that on our website and in the show notes, so if you want to send some money their way to help them out, we'll have that for you. That kind of wraps up our discussion about The Last House Guest by Megan Miranda. We hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you didn't read the book with us, we hope you at least enjoyed the cases that we talked about today and learned a little bit about some more true crime. Because a lot of times in these like true crime episodes, people talk about longer cases and cases that fill up an episode. So we love to be able to talk to you guys a little bit about some smaller scale cases. Coming on May 7th is our next book club episode, and we are very excited to talk to you guys about it. It's Picking Cotton, our our memoir of Injustice and Redemption by Aaron Tornillo, Jennifer Thompson Canino, and Ronald Cotton. Picking Cotton is a nonfiction book, but it's written like a story. Like, it's so good. So you guys will really love it. And here's a little synopsis just to kind of give you guys a taste of what it's about. Quote, Jennifer Thompson was raped at knife point by a man who broke into her apartment while she slept. She was able to escape and eventually positively identified Ronald Cotton as her attacker. Ronald insisted that she was mistaken, but Jennifer's positive indication was the compelling evidence that put him behind bars. After 11 years, Ronald was allowed to take a DNA test that proved his innocence. After he he was released after serving more than a decade in prison for a crime he never committed. Two years later, Jennifer and Ronald met face-to-face and forged an unlikely friendship that changed both of their lives. 
With picking cotton, Jennifer and Ronald tell in their own words the harrowing details of their tragedy and challenge our ideas of memory and judgment while demonstrating the profound nature of human grace and the healing power of forgiveness, end quote. It is such a beautiful book. Like, just, it's so good. I think you guys will really like it. Yeah, it's an amazing book, an amazing story, and we're really excited to talk about it with you next month. Yeah, it it gives you a totally different perspective about what is going on with the cases we talk about. So when you talk about these cases, it's very cut and dry most of the time, kind of how nurses and doctors are cut and dry in the doctor's office because they just have to get used to it. It's just normal for them to see, you know, someone dying or things like that, that they kind of have a different mindset for it. It's this totally changes everything. It makes you think about before the conviction, after the conviction, during the serving time, like everything, it, just all of it together and per- perspectives of both people. So it's really good. Yeah, I think that's a cool thing about this book that a lot of times when we talk about wrongful convictions, it's like just from the perspective of the wrongfully convicted and like what they went through. And usually even that, it's not from their own words. It's just like someone's perception of that. So this book is cool because it's it's the victim of like the crime and then it's the victim of the wrongful conviction and it's the emotions of both of them how they feel about each other and it's just really well written so yeah if you haven't read any of the books that we've done in book club so far please read this read one, this one. <laughs> it's so good even do an audiobook like audiobook it it's only like what i think it's seven, seven hours. hours yeah not you can speed that ish up yeah i, I listen to it on like 1.4 yeah and it's good so i listen to it slow but it's <laughs> fine <laughs> But yeah, definitely check that out and join us next month as we talk about it. And be sure to comment if you have any comments. You can DM us if you have any suggestions or anything you want to talk about. We're here. So yeah, thank you for diving into the abyss with us. Bye.